In the last part, we stopped at the moment where Letitia, together with the girl who guards her, were present by chance at the conversation of her past husband, Aster, with his friend, where Aster said about his wife that if life is easily ended by a regular divorce, it's over. As we remember everyone, and even the Aster family think that our heroine Letitia is dead, and the man tells his friend Vandal that it is for these reasons to pray for the soul of his ex-wife, for him a waste of time. After hearing this, our heroine began to cry, and Alexa, seeing that her mistress feels bad, suggested her to leave the place. But at that moment from behind his desk, Wandel stands up and asks our heroine if she's okay. Alexa stops the man at one point and says it's nothing, and advises the man to continue his conversation and not to intervene. But Vandal says that in Nordland it's not customary to pass by a crying woman, and asks Alexa to let him know if he can help. Alexa got a little angry and asked the man if she did not clearly explain to him that everything is all right. But suddenly in the room appears our heroine's rescuer and apologizes for being late, and then turned to our heroine and said that it is worth it to leave her alone for a while, and she immediately starts crying. Apparently our hero wanted to get Letitia out of this situation, and touching her, he asked our heroine what he should do with her now so that she would no longer cry and calm down. But our heroine was very much surprised to see Prince Zeonian. At this moment, Alexa turns to the prince and asks him why he was so late and made my lady cry, and then asked him, how long can you wait for him? But Sion apologized and hugged our heroine said that from now on, he will no longer make her wait. Our, the Zionian told our heroine that he would buy her whatever she wanted, and then told her it was time for them to leave the place. And turning around, the man looked at Wandel, who was left alone and with his mouth open. Our heroes were already on their way and Letitia was still crying. And Sionian noticed that she was crying again and asked her if she still loved her ex. But our heroine started to deny and said that she no longer loved him. But the prince said that it was a lie. Our heroine said that all her words are true. And her tears are just an unpleasant residue. And gave the example of twigs and asked him if cut and long-rotting twigs do not flow sap, and then added that her feelings are the same. To herself, our heroine thought that she could not believe that she was crying and forgetting, and that the prince must think that she was pathetic. But the man at that time wiped her tears and said that she was very sensitive, and it was very easy to hurt her. Zionian put his hands on the face of our heroine and said that she does not even hide the fact that she is easily hurt. He says that if he were in her place, he would rather bite off his tongue than let himself be seen in such a way. And then he turned around and said that apparently our heroine needs more enlightenment. Our heroine at first could not understand what he meant by enlightenment. But at that time, the prince came to the carriage and told our heroine that he had something to show her, and so she should follow him silently, without any questions. It was already dark outside, and our heroes came to some place, and our heroine was surprised at first that they came here, and the prince asked her if she knew where they were, and then he added that it was the family cemetery of the Winchester family. While they were leaving the carriage, Letitia asked the prince why they came to this place, and he just kept silent and walked ahead of her. Our heroine silently followed him, and at one point the prince stopped and told our heroine to read to herself what is written on one tomb. Apparently our heroine began to panic, and at the same time looked sadly at the grave. But the prince told the girl to hurry up and read, and our heroine with sadness and tears in her eyes said that it says, Letitia Violet Winchester. Then Zionian asked Langaro, what is the funeral custom in Nordland? And he replied that one custom is that together with the deceased in the coffin, buried his favorite things, namely his favorite flowers, dress, family photos, or things that are associated with the deceased, such as dolls. While our heroine tearfully held a few flowers in her hands, Zion turned to Letitia Violet Winchester and asked her if she was curious about what was inside her coffin. Letitia in despair told His Majesty that she did not want to know what was inside her coffin, but Zion told the girl that this was wrong as he believed that the girl needed enlightenment, and then he ordered the men to dig. Two men began to dig the grave, and at the moment when they pulled out the coffin, our heroine touched it and said that it was quite cheap. It was after this that Sion ordered the men to open the coffin, 
and it seems that at the sight of what is in there our heroine was left in shock. Letitia could not believe her eyes and thought it was too cruel because there was only garbage in the coffin. And at that moment Zion's assistant said that it was really very cruel because he could not understand how it was possible to fill the coffin to the top with garbage. Apparently Letitia was no longer herself. And Cyan at this time a little embraced our heroine and said that in Nortland inside the coffin of the deceased stored things that symbolized him during his lifetime and told our heroine to look at what is in this coffin. Cyan, looking directly at the coffin, asked Letitia if she was still sad about those times when she was together with her husband. But our heroine, after a few seconds, fainted, and Cyan managed to catch her and said that she was too weak character. Zion's assistant said that our heroine is probably in shock and asked Zion if that's not what he wanted, and said that he wanted to show her that. And Zion said that Letizia is so stupid that if she is not properly warned, she will not understand. Sion said he did so because the revenge she craves won't be easy. And Sion's aide said that His Highness's methods are always effective, but he believes he doesn't always pick the right moment. Zion's assistant advised him to apologize to Our Lady when she woke up, and said that he was more than sure that Letitia was having another terrible nightmare, since he noticed that our heroine had begun to tremble again. The next morning our heroine finally woke up, and looking around realized that she was in His Highness's room, and when she noticed Sion, she immediately got out of bed and thought to herself that she should go back to her room. Sion saw that our heroine had already woken up and was about to leave and stopped her, and advised her to just lie down and rest, as he believes that she is still not recovered from the shock because she still has a fever. Letitia tucked into bed and asked Sion what she did wrong that she deserved all this, for she says she loved her ex-husband and tried her best to make them happy. Letizia says that she did not want to be petty or cowardly towards her love, and according to her, even if no one else knows it, she is still sure that she did everything possible to keep this love alive, but she does not know if these feelings were such a mistake that even her death was insulted because of them. Our heroine really started to get very sad, but Sion at this point said that it's not her fault as she tried her best and was sure of her love, but he thinks that she just chose the wrong person. Sion approached the bed and knelt before our heroine. And then he began to listen to our heroine, and she said that she knew, and immediately Sion asked her what exactly she knew, and our heroine said that even after such treatment, she would give her heart again. Letizia says that even after all this, if this man, namely her ex-husband, tells her that he is having a hard time, she will come and take his burdens upon herself, and even if it is a lie, she will still believe in him. Our heroine said that then to believe and be deceived, it would be harder for her to regret that she had not believed. And after these words, she clutched her nightie and said that if she could, she would kill herself as Lianca had done. Letitia began to weep very hard and said that her very existence was a great mistake, for she believed that she should not have been born. And it seems that these words touched Sion, and he thought that Langaro was right in thinking that this weak woman had a broken heart and body. Sion thought it might be the shock therapy too, since it was as if he'd hit her crack with a hammer, in which case he felt it was his duty to see that she didn't break. Then Zion began to stroke our heroine's head and told her that just as a deer cannot become a wolf, neither can a sheep become a tiger, and told her that she was born that way. But in his head, he thought that the hand that would heal her wound should be his. His Majesty Sion began to wipe away the tears of our heroine and told her that she was not guilty of anything. And then he pulled the girl quite strongly to himself and added that the whole problem is that she chose the wrong partner. Afterwards, he kissed Letitia on the forehead and said that because she had chosen the wrong partner, she should not be held responsible because he believed that only her ex-husband, who did not appreciate her love, and her mistress, who wanted to take her place, were to blame and he said that it was these people who should be held responsible for what they had done. Then he laid our heroine on the bed and told her not to take responsibility for her grief, because she had done everything in her power and was sure of her feelings. Zion lay on top of the girl and told her to be proud of herself, and at that moment our heroine blushed quite a bit and looked straight into Zion's eyes, and it was at that moment that Zion smiled and said that finally our heroine had stopped crying. His Majesty began to approach our heroine and asked her if she was still in so much pain that she wanted to kill herself. 
and our heroine replied that she was no longer in so much pain, but that she still had sore spots. Cyan began to touch the lips of our heroine with his hands, and said that, of course, it is not the responsibility of a solo, but as a man he believes that he can help Letitia, and apparently Cyan hinted to our heroine on intimacy, but apparently the girl did not even mind. After that, our heroine also touched Cyan, and he said that he was sure that then there would be no pain, because he believes that she cannot even think about his ex. And after that, he passionately began to kiss our heroine in the neck and then all over her body. At this time, our heroine thought that Mr. Winchester was her everything, and she was nothing to him. She thinks that next to him, she always thought that she was not good enough, and that's why every time she locked herself up and hated herself. Letizia thinks that the one who made her feel this way was her ex-husband, and now she clearly sees what she should regret. And that is that she should have loved herself more than him, because with him, she always only suffered. During their intimacy, our heroine looked with big eyes directly at Zion and even blushed a little, and he told our heroine that she should look at him that way, and then began to kiss her passionately, and she thought that she would try her best for those who cherish her. After their intimacy, we can notice that they are both in a good mood, and apparently they had a very good time, and our heroine. While getting dressed, thanks Sion for last night and said that she will not repeat it. Our heroine said she's terrible now, but she promises she'll do better. And that's why one day she'll be a useful tool for his highness. And that's why she asked Zion if he'd give her up. The half-naked Sion said that every time she did that, he hated Letitia Violet. But he hoped very much that Anna Rosa Victoire would like him very much. And after these words, they exchanged glances and smiles for a few seconds. His Majesty Sion began to put on his shirt and at the same time told our heroine that when she arrived in the Duchy of Canth, she would have a rather strict schedule, and added that the Langaro had to organize everything so that there would be no inconvenience. After his words, Sion looked at our heroine with his eyes and told her that before she left, he would do her a favor, and that is why if she needs anything, she can safely tell him. Our heroine squeezed her dress a little and replied to Sion that she had already received too much, but if she could ask for anything else, she would like to receive flowers as a present. And Sion seemed rather surprised to hear such a trivial request. Letizia said that one flower would be enough, but His Majesty asked our heroine why she needed this flower. And our lovely heroine said that some time ago, her friend told her that she received a bouquet of flowers from the man with whom she spent her first night. Our heroine said that she was very much jealous of it, because she never received flowers as a gift and for a few seconds she became sad. Then she smiled and told Sion that then she would go to her room. But after leaving, Sion looked at the vase with flowers that was in her room, and could not understand why our heroine asked for such a trivial thing. A little later, our heroine together with Alexa, apparently were in a pastry shop because they chose some cakes, and Alexa asked our heroine if she liked the view of the Port of Kant. And our heroine smiling, said that she had a wonderful time and did not even feel tired in her legs. Alexa said that it was her mistake not to notice it, but our heroine said that she had a lot of fun and Alexa should pay attention to all this, and then Alexa advised our heroine to go and rest. But our heroine that she also did a good job, and that's why she should have a better rest. Our heroine has already reached her room, and at the moment when she opened the front door, she was very surprised to see her room filled with flowers, and then she remembered the moment when she asked Zion for one flower, and he gave her a whole room full of flowers. Our heroine rejoiced very much, and thought that in a year for his highness who had given her the gift of spring when I asked for only one flower, she would return a perfect Anna Rosa victoire. And at that moment she took one bouquet in her hands and pressed it very hard against her. Time flew by unnoticed not only for those who hurt our heroine, but also for the one who was floating that day on the stream. And our heroine sat at the same table and drank her tea at that moment, as thought that it has been a year since she came to the county of Kant. Apparently our heroine misses Sion quite a lot because she is wondering how his highness is doing. We learn that for a whole year Sion has never contacted our heroine, and it seems that these thoughts alarm her. At that moment a man came into the room and called Anna Rosa and asked our heroine what she was thinking about. It turns out this man is a Marquis, and his name is Edgar Bodrin, 
But after that, our heroine asked the man what exactly he means. Rosa asked Edgar if he should worry about any of the things a homesteader who only enjoys life does. But Edgar was indignant enough to tell our heroine never to say she's a homesteader again. Edgar said that she is a precious guest and friend of the Baudrin house. And it is at this point that we learn that the Baudrin family, namely the Marquises, are known for their liquor business in Canton County. And they are also her teachers, who have been very helpful to her in learning the unique accent, customs, and culture of the county. We learn that they were introduced to our heroine as allies by His Highness Sion, and it is this family that will confirm her identity as Anna Rosa Victoire. But then our heroine comes out of her thoughts, and smiling told Edgar that these are indeed very nice words. Edgar said that he had heard that our heroine was returning to Northland soon, and with a sad look added that he had heard that she had some business to attend to there. And then our heroine smilingly said that this was the only way she could be completely reborn as Anna Rosa Victoire. Edgar very sadly told Dew that he is concerned because perhaps when our heroine leaves here she may be caught in the epicenter of a terrible storm, and so he thinks that this way she will be sad again, and maybe she won't be able to compose herself to smile like when they first met. Anna Rosa thanked Edgar for his concern, but said that she was a year ago and now were very different people. But Edgar blushed a little, and said that he thought it would be in presumptuous request, but still asked our heroine to think again before leaving. Our heroine was surprised enough, and at that moment a girl came into the room and asked Edgar why he shouldn't go to the warehouse to get some supplies. And now we find out that this girl's name is Marzi Bodrin. Marzi asked Edgar why he should say those words if he knew they would sound presumptuous, because she didn't understand what other epicenter of the storm he was talking about, because she knew that the boy had been sleeping in his literature class. Marzi looked at our heroine and asked her why she listens to these ravings and how she can call herself a Kant woman after that. But our heroine laughingly apologized to Marzi. But the latter told Du to say specifically what she was apologizing for. Anna Rosa began to say that there is a saying in Kant that when the sea breeze blows, you should unfurl the sails. And then she added that as they say, time is precious, and asked if she was not guilty of missing that precious time. And at that moment, Marzi said it was perfect. Marzi as a mad woman began to laugh and hugged our heroine, and then asked, who will now look at Du as a foreigner? But our heroine smiling said that it is all thanks to the best teacher, but Marzi said that Dew flattered her, and our heroine said that it is all true. Our heroine said that she thinks it is very difficult to teach other people, and that is why she will always be grateful to Marzi. And Ta at this time smiled and said that it is very nice, and she is going to die of cuteness. After a few seconds, Marzi pulled out an envelope and said that our heroine worked very hard, and that's why she thinks that they should give her a reward, namely a new identity card. And opening it, our heroine was very surprised but at the same time rejoiced. While our heroine remained in shock, Marzi said that today's Countess Victoire is a collateral relative of the Marquis Baudrin, and then added that she hopes for her cooperation and called her cousin. Rosa was very happy and hugged Marzi, then very much thanked for all their care, but Marzi said that it is still very early to be impressed. After all, she has one more surprise, but on our heroine a little bit did not understand what she means. And after that... Marzi told someone that now he can go out. Suddenly, Langaro came into the room, and our heroine was very much surprised to see him. And he told our heroine that they had not seen each other for a long time, and added that our heroine was much better looking, and said that he thought it was the best decision to seek the patronage of the Marquis of Bodrin. Du was very happy and thought that Zion had not forgotten about her. And then she asked Langaro how he was doing. And he said that everything was fine and he was busy as always with the affairs of His Highness Zionian. And then our heroine asked Alan Horosh what he was doing here, or he came to pick her up after a year. Langaro said that the reason he was here was to test our heroine. And at that moment he took something out of his pocket, and then he handed our heroine an envelope. Anna Rosa was surprised enough to hear that Langaro had come to test her. But the man said that all this time the girl had been studying hard, and in every report from Miss Marzi and the Marquis of Bodrin, there are many positive comments. Langaro asked Du to familiarize herself with the contents of that letter. And when the girl read very much surprised to see the invitation to the flower ceremony, 
and Marzi at the same time asked, if this is an invitation from Duke Sullivan. It turns out that every year in early summer, Duke Sullivan holds a big tea party, and this is the place where most of the nobles of Kant are invited. And then in the hangar told our heroine that if she wants to confirm her identity as a noblewoman of Kant, there is no better chance for her. Marzi said that it was an opportunity to impress the whole nobility at once, but our heroine barked that it was her test, and at this time said that during the tea party, she must not let anyone guess that she was a foreigner, and added that it was a test to her from His Highness Zion. A little later, our heroine together with Marzi were in the girl's room, and the latter told our heroine that in this case, no green color could be used because the tea party would be held during the day, and this color was too dark. The girl suggested using light colors, and our heroine at this time somehow confused listened to her and did not answer anything. But at this time, Maria said that in her opinion our heroine is more suitable sky blue color, but this time she thinks that she will suit her different. Marzi asked Rosa if this her appearance in the society can be considered as her debut, but our heroine said that she had been married before and it cannot be considered as a debut. But Marzi said that it is absolutely nobody cares because it is her first appearance in their society, which means that it is her debut. Marzi looked a little expressively at our heroine and grabbed her and advised her to be bolder, and then added that she thought that the accent of the do was perfect, and that's why she thinks that as long as a girl doesn't lose her head, she won't make any mistakes. After a few seconds, Marzi asked do if she knows what her biggest problem is, but our heroine doesn't even seem to have a clue, and asked Marzi what that problem is, and Marzi said the problem is that she is very shy. But according to her, the woman in Kant is not shy at all. Marzi said that maybe everyone has their flaws and it won't be a problem. But she believes that our heroine doesn't need to be perfect to be confident, because she deserves to be brave for trying. Apparently, our heroine was almost ready to go out because she was put on a beautiful dress, and she was surprised to look at herself in the mirror. But at the same time, Marzi continued her speech and said that, among other things, her ex-husband and his mistress were to blame for everything. Marzi said that Rosa should be proud of herself because, according to her, our heroine is not a criminal. But at the same moment, our heroine was a little surprised and thanked Marzi for her words, but then added that she is indeed a criminal because she believes that she is guilty of impersonating another person and forging documents. Du thinks that by acting like Anna Rosa Victoire, she is already guilty of fraud. But Marzi interrupted her and she doesn't seem to agree with her friend at all, and then asked her if she wasn't going to wear the dress she had prepared for the girl. Dew smiled sweetly, and to Marzi's question, answered that of course she was going to wear that dress because it was chosen especially for her. And then Marzi said that in her opinion, blue jewelry with simple decorations would suit the image of our heroine. Marzi seconds before she left told the girl to be ready in the morning as she would be waiting for her at the main entrance, but it seems our heroine was a little surprised that Marzi would go with her and asked her friend if they would go to events together. Marzi began to laugh and mock our heroine a little, telling her that the invitation had been sent to her in the first place and not to Rosa. And at this moment, our heroine thought that Marzi was really very good, for she thought that she could have sent her alone, but she had kindly taken care to go together, and in her mind, she thanked Marzi for her act. It was already night outside, and our heroine could not seem to leave in peace some thoughts, and at one moment she thought about what she dreams that tomorrow came soon. But it seems that the girl was not sure of herself, and did not know whether she could cope with her mission. At one point in the middle of the night, our heroine suddenly opened her eyes, and saw her past identity in front of her, and her ex-husband and his mistress. But this is just a simple nightmare. But in this dream, the mistress of her ex-husband said that she is very happy that they can be and sit at the table together as a real family. Hugging her lover told him that she had waited a long time for this day, this moment, and then asked her lover if Letitia was not offended that she said that. But at that moment the bastard told his mistress not to worry about it, because this woman was just a step on the way to their happiness. At this moment our heroine thought about the fact that she does not understand when she can completely free herself from this hell. But immediately appears Zion, who grabbed our heroine by the hand and told her that she is really annoying. It seems that in the dream, our heroine was very much surprised to see His Highness Zion in front of her.
but he told her that her appearance has greatly improved, but it seems to him that she is still so weak that she seems to break as soon as you take your eyes off her. Sin Kissing Our heroine's hand said that he thought it was strange that there was something in her weakness that attracted him, and at this point, our heroine got a little embarrassed and began to laugh sweetly, and asked Sion if he knew before that smells like the sun. Sion, after a few seconds, kissed our heroine on the head and told her that she smells like tears. But our heroine could not understand what this smell is and asked Sion about it. And he said that the smell is salty, mountainous, but a little sweet, like a wet curtain in the rain. After these words, His Highness drew our heroine to him very much. And Ardu said that she is really much better now. But our heroine said that it is always a difficult time before waking and falling asleep and she does not know when time will heal it. His Highness took our heroine in his arms and advised her to try to sleep well tonight. And then he took her to the very room filled with flowers. And at that moment, our heroine thanked him for them and then added that even if she died, she would never forget it. Sion started kissing our heroine passionately and said that he could bring her many more flowers. And after he put our girl on the bed and started kissing her, he advised her to keep trying because he read that she was good at it. But suddenly someone called our heroine and she woke up. Already on the way, being in the carriage, our heroine thought that she had had a wonderful dream. She was very glad, and thought that it even seemed to her as if His Highness really came to her. But her friend interrupted her from her thoughts and asked her what she was thinking about. Marzi asked Du if she was worried, but our heroine said that of course she was worried, but only a little. And then Marzi said that she could see it in her face and asked her to make her proud. And our heroine thanked her friend and promised that she would definitely do it. Finally, our heroes arrived at the place where the ceremony will take place. And at the same moment, Edgar approached our heroine and marveled at her appearance, saying that no country has such a beautiful lady as they have, and that he thought he would go blind at the sight of her. But our heroine did not even thank but switched to another topic and said that today the sun is very bright. Marzi got into their conversation and asked the guys if she was going crazy, because she said to Edgar that he had never complimented her in his life. But Edgar started to tease the girl, saying that it was strange that he thought that Actinia had started talking lately. Marzi attacked the guy, saying that it was too much for her. But Edgar asked Marzi if he said something wrong, and at the same time Marzi told the guy that he was making her angry and our heroine was looking somewhere in the distance with a surprised look and asked Marzi to look there too. It appears that the carriages have begun to approach, and Marzi, waving her fan, says that the guests are beginning to gather for the tea ceremony, and that's why it's time for them to go show off their rose. And at that very moment, she extends her hand to Anna Rosa. In an unexpected way, one man approached our girls, and Humorous asked Marzi, who stands in front of him, if it is the famous Marzi Badrin, and our beautiful and smart girl asked him in reply who he is since she thinks he is not that famous. The man started pointing his finger at Marzi and told her not to pretend that they didn't know each other because they had already run into each other many times, and at the same moment Edgar approached and told the man that they hadn't seen each other for a long time and called him Earl Hayden. The Count after greeting asked the Marquis de Baudrin how he was doing. And at the same moment, Marzi said that she now understood who the man was, and then asked him how long he was going to follow her and make an argument with her. Marzi said it wasn't her fault that the man's fiancé admires her, and then she told him that he shouldn't pursue her for his fiancé because she thinks it's out of line. The Count charged Marzi that he had come to this place instead of the first, and that she had arrived later. But our Marzi did not want to argue with him, and then she advised him to just go on, but still asked him if he had not waited for her, and the man said that it was not so because they had also just arrived. While the two were talking, the Count's fiancé, named Charlene, suddenly approached them and began to admire Marzi, saying that she was very beautiful today, and that she thought Miss Marzi shone brighter than all the jewelry on her dress. Marzi thanked Charlene graciously, but at the same moment the girl noticed Anna Rosa and asked Marzi who her companion was, and Marzi immediately grabbed our heroine's hand saying that it was her relative, Countess Anna Rosa Victoire, and that her father had recently passed away. And that is why she was preoccupied with the family succession. And that is the motive 
why she is making her debut in society so late. Our heroine bowed a little to the girl and said that she was very glad to meet her, and the latter said in surprise that our heroine just has a special kind of beauty, and it seems to her that it is because she is a relative of Miss Marzi, and our heroine kindly thanked her. Olivia, the sister of our heroine's ex-husband, came up to them in a very unexpected way and asked her if she was from Kant, and then she said that they had crossed paths in Northland. Well, our heroine was very surprised and at the same time frightened at the sight of Olivia. After this scene, Charlene introduced Olivia by saying that she was her friend and she was from Northland, and Olivia introduced herself by saying that her name was Olivia Winchester. But at this point, our heroine started to get very nervous, and in her head she tried to calm herself down by saying that she shouldn't be so nervous because she was no longer Letitia Violet. Right after that, our heroine started smiling sweetly and told Olivia that she thought they were watching the ships in the harbor together. And Livia said that she remembered our heroine because she had a very beautiful profile and added that now she was also very beautiful. After a few seconds, Olivia switched to Marquis Edgar, saying that she'd heard from Charlene that he was Marzi's older brother. And at the same moment, Edgar said with a serious look that he'd also heard about the Winchester family from Northland. Edgar said that he had heard about the recently opened business in Northland, namely the production of White Tea Astero Winchester. But Olivia was very much surprised and asked the Marquis if he knew her brother. And Edgar said that Kant is a trading country. And that's why he, as a businessman, is also interested in the trading tendencies of other countries. At this point, Olivia smiled like a fool and innocently asked herself how her brothers came up with such a wonderful idea, namely to import white tea and Westeros itself. But our heroine thought that looking at the faces of the Marzi, and she assumed that they had heard about it, namely about how she lived in Northland. At this time, Edgar said that as far as he had heard, white tea is ideal for neutralizing lime water, which in Northland is considered to be a quality problem. And then Edgar said that such water when combined with white tea is good for the skin, and asked Olivia how they discovered the effectiveness of tea leaves that only grow in Westeros. Edgar said that this was very interesting to him, since he thought this product had been discontinued in Northland because of its unusually sour taste, at which point Charlene said that this was indeed the case, since it was not particularly popular in Northland, which hates such things. Olivia said she is very embarrassed to admit, but when her brother first started this business, their whole family was against it, and her brother was going to import exclusively white tea, which had already failed in Nortland, and she says she even thought her brother was crazy. Olivia says that no one supported his decision, and that her brother achieved it solely by his own efforts. But our heroine at that moment thought that it was a brazen lie, because she remembered those moments when she was close to her ex-husband. Our heroine thought she was the one who lent him the money to grow the business to show her faith and support. And because she was so desperate to support Aster, her father eventually passed away. But at that moment, Olivia said it was truly amazing to her how people meet. Our heroine thought that the whole family was using her as fertilizer for their own growth, but nothing changed. But at that moment, Olivia said that she didn't expect to meet our heroine. So again and that she hoped they would become friends, and at the same moment, she extended her hand to Rosa. Our heroine looked at Olivia confusedly at her purse, and finally she said that her purse was very beautiful, and Olivia asked her if she thought it was a great design too, and then added that the purse came with a fan. Olivia said that this purse is made of rare silk, brought from a distant history. Hearing about it, the guy on the street, the guy approaches the girls who fell in love. Days he holds out no one, and asks him at this time the protagonist remembered the moment when Olivia wore a dress that was a gift from her grandmother. Rosa came to her senses and said there was nothing surprising about it because she thought it was a beautiful thing, and it turned out to be only a secondary product because she felt that such a pattern would fit the dress better. At this point, Olivia started to play some role and asked our heroine how she recognized these things as she says that originally it really was a dress, but it was altered. And our heroine said that it was a pointless job, as she thinks that the girl would be more suitable for a dress. Do asked Olivia why she did it, and she seemed a little angry. And then she started playing her part again, and said that it was actually a gift left to her by her dead sister-in-law. And every time she looked at the bag and the fan, she thought of her. Olivia said that she would love to go back in time when she was still alive. But at that moment, 
our heroine, as if the earth had gone out from under her feet and in her head, asked herself if this girl thinks that about her. But after a few seconds, she thought that it cannot be. Du said that once upon a time, an aristocrat from Kant missed his deceased wife, and added that the girl might have heard but in memory of her, the man had kept her room in the same condition for forty years. The Count's fiancée immediately recognized the story, and said that it was a story about Baron Meadow. And our heroine said that it was all true, and said that the Baron took such care of the room that it seemed as if his wife was about to open the door and come out of there. Olivia smiled a little and said that it was unbelievable, because no matter what country you live in, the longing for the dead is the same, and added that she thought that was the fate of those who were left behind. But our heroine told Olivia that she had no right to say that because she had torn up the clothes left by her relative and made a bag out of them. Olivia seemed angry and surprised at the same time, and after a few seconds she said, smiling, that in time the old clothes in the closet would be forgotten, and she was afraid and worried that she would forget about them, and that the purse and fan could always be kept with her. Shameless Olivia said that she would like to prolong the memory of her dead sister-in-law in this way. But at the same moment, the Count's fiancé took pity on Olivia and said that she didn't understand how a person's soul could be so kind. Our heroine did not believe a word of what Olivia said and thought that it was a blatant lie because these clothes did not fit her, because unlike our heroine Olivia, as well as Aster, has a slim build and length of limbs, and she remembered that when she was kicked out of the house, she put it on by force to make fun of her. Du thought that Olivia could not wear this dress for long. However, it seemed to her that this girl liked the dress very much, if she even ordered to cut it and remake it. But still, our heroine could not understand how Olivia could do this to her grandmother's precious gift. Marzi noticed the state of our heroine and approached her very strongly and told her to hold on, because they do not know where the Langaro may be watching them. But at the same moment, the Count asked Olivia why their daughter-in-law died, because he says that he thought they were the same age. Olivia said her sister-in-law came from a dysfunctional family and so their whole family tried to treat her with love, but she says she still didn't feel happy and so she thinks their feelings didn't reach her heart. At that moment, Olivia began to pretend as if she were crying and said that why when the last member of the girl's family passed away, her sister also went to get him. And the Count's sister-in-law was frightened because she believed Olivia and asked her not to cry. Olivia said that everything is in the past, but she still has a very bad heartache when she thinks about the fact that she could not do something for her ex-sister-in-law. But our heroine was angry and thought that she did not choose to die, and it was them who killed her. Our heroine thought it was just a pity they couldn't steal more from her because she had nothing left, and she thought these people were murderers. But at the same moment, Marzi asked Olivia why she had come all the way from Northland. Olivia began to answer Marzi's question, and said that she had come here because she was anxious to see the famous port of Kant County. But Marzi said it was a very long distance, and asked the girl if she was accompanied by anyone. But Olivia said she had come alone. Olivia said that since Charlene was here, she felt like she was here with a friend. But Marcy said it was amazing. And Olivia asked Marcy what exactly she thought was amazing. And Marcy said that since she knew it wasn't customary for single women to travel alone to foreign countries. Marzi said that moreover she realizes that Nortland is a particularly conservative place of old views regarding women, and since these stereotypes are very narrow, overly strict, she does not understand that Lady Olivia came to another country alone. Our heroine Du thought that Marzi says everything right, because when she will marry may be unnecessary rumors, but she could not understand how Olivia still received permission to come to the distant county of Kant. Olivia smiled innocently and told Marzi that her mother wanted her to see and learn more about the big world, because she loved and cared for her only daughter so much. But at that moment our heroine looked at her and thought that it was not true because Clarissa had given all her love to her son. Our heroine believes that now that the family's stock price has risen due to the success of the Astor business, and her daughter is finding it difficult to be active in social circles and establish relationships with good families, and our heroine is not going to believe that Olivia has arrived alone in this together, and she is sure that Olivia is hiding something. Suddenly a woman appears, who said she could see dear faces, and then greeted the Marquis of Bodrin and Miss Marzi and the other guests, and it turns out this woman is the Duchess of Sullivan.
The Duchess, smiling sweetly, said that they were very happy to have everyone there to join the Sullivan family tea party, and Edgar in due course told the Duchess that they were honored to be there with them, and Duchess Sullivan thanked them for the visit. Duchess Sullivan was a little confused, but smiling asked everyone why they were still in this place and apologized for still being here and then said it was no big deal. But at the same time, Charlene took Olivia and told her to go together. When our heroine heard this, she thought that for Olivia this is not the end, and a little edge of the eye looked back at her. And then she thought about the fact that she can forget the offense, but in no case cannot forget the offenders, and our heroine is going to pay them back everything in full. At last, our heroes reached the place where the tea party was taking place. And our heroine turned around and thought that a beautiful melody and tasty treats, as well as intelligent conversations of honorable noblemen, were the best place for a debut in society. While our heroine was following Marzi and Edgar, a small cat passed by her, and it seems that our heroine noticed him and thought that this little one was raised by the Duke. And at that moment, our heroine thought that she should also take one when she returned to Northland. Our heroine sweetly looked at the cat and admired him. And she also thought about the fact that she never had such a cat because of Aster's allergies. But at that time, Marzi and Edgar pulled our heroine out of her thoughts, saying that they already see their table. And Edgar saw that our heroine was distracted and began to rush her. Du looked a little at Kotick and followed her friends. And after they reached their table, a waiter came to them. And Marzi said that she wanted black tea and wine the strongest, and also a sandwich with salmon and basil. Edgar said he wanted the same thing, but our heroine wondered if anyone would realize that she was not from Skanda, because we learned that at first our heroine had a hard time getting used to their tea culture, and at that moment, the waiter asks our heroine what she would like, and our heroine said that she wanted a simple cream tea. Our heroes were sitting at the table, as suddenly two men approached them, and one of them told Edgar that they had not seen each other for a long time, and suggested that he was very busy these days because he did not even go sailing. And then the other said that he was waiting for Edgar and was upset that he did not come. Edgar smilingly said that the wine shipping season was coming soon, and that's why he had something to worry about until it was over, and those men were surprised that it was coming so soon and said they would look forward to their wine. One man switched to Marzi and told her that she was more beautiful today than ever, because he thinks that there is no dress that would not fit her, and told our heroine that she was very bright like coral in the sea, and asked her if she liked their tea. At first our heroine looked quite displeased, but after that she smiled and thanked the man for asking her if she liked it. After that she asked the men if they didn't want to ask her anything else, and it seems that the guys got embarrassed because their cheeks turned red and they were surprised by this question. One of the men said that if that was the case, then he would ask Marzi who was the lady who was sitting next to her, and turning to Rose told her that even though it was the first time they had seen each other, but he could not help saying that she was beautiful, and then added that the moment he saw the lady he could not believe his eyes and thought that our heroine had come straight from a famous painting. Marzina started laughing and said that this is her younger sister, and then asked them if Du is really so beautiful. But at this point, our heroine thought that in fact she is two years older than Marzi, but still she thinks that if you are beautiful, no one will say that she is older. After that, our heroine greeted the men and introduced herself as Anna Rosa Victoire, and hearing the surname of our heroine, the men asked her if it was not one of the families of believers of its origin from the Marquis, and our heroine answered him to this question and said that he was right, but not many people know about it. The man said that his great-great-grandfather had once mentioned it, and afterwards he added that he was very much worried about the future of the Victoire family too, for the Count had died suddenly and left no heir. And he said that of course he had expected the matter of inheritance to be difficult, but still he was surprised to see such a Countess before him. Edgar saw that our heroine was embarrassed and started laughing, saying that it is truly amazing because even after several generations the black hair of Victoire remains the same. And one of the men said that this is all true because his friend also had very dark hair, and his name was Revan. When our heroine realized that Edgar had saved her, she exhaled with relief and thanked Edgar for his help. And immediately after that some people approached them and asked them what they were talking about with such an interesting conversation, 
and asked for their approval to join them. Everyone started to talk to each other, and one of them asked our heroine if she was a relative of Marzi and was surprised that she was so young and had already inherited a family. And it seems that time flew by unnoticed, because a little later our heroine said that she was very pleased to meet everyone and apologized and asked for a moment to step back. Coming from the table, our heroine thought that so far her debut was going very well, but it seems that because of the strong relaxation, our heroine was tired, and she thought that she should take a break and started to leave the place soon. As she was leaving, our heroine heard Count Hayden ask his wife if she was not going to wear the turquoise ring today, for he tells her that he was going to do so and put on the blue cuffs, and his wife said that it was very strange to her. But when she was going to wash her hands, she took it off for a moment and put it on the table, and then noticed that it was gone. Our heroine was a little surprised to hear this, but the Count asked his wife if it was possible that the ring had fallen on the floor, and his wife said that she thought so too, and immediately began to look for it, but did not find it, and the Count said that maybe it rolled under the furniture and specified that they should tell the servants to move and look. The Count began to suspect that a maid had done it because he said he had heard that they had recently hired a new maid, and Charlene said that it couldn't be because Hannah wouldn't do it, and the Count said that they knew what the ring looked like, and the pattern was so unique that it wouldn't be easy to sell, and so they would find it quickly. Going into the mansion, our heroine seems to look surprised, and she thought it can't be, but she suspects that Olivia did it, but it's hard to believe it because she thinks that the girl wouldn't have come all this way to do it. Our heroine quickly went into one room and found there Olivia, who was very much frightened by the ghost, and it seems that she began to panic, and our heroine noticed that Olivia just hid something up her sleeve. Our heroine pulled herself together a bit, and tried to ignore what Olivia had hidden. But instead, she asked her how she thought the tea party in Kant County was, and she also asked Olivia if this tea party was a bit different from Northland. But it seems Olivia looks a bit pissed off. Even if Olivia was not happy that our heroine had entered this room, she still tried and said that indeed everything seemed a little unfamiliar here. But she thought that Kant was unique. And after that, she said that she thought that the Countess, that is, our heroine and Miss Marzi had received a lot of attention. As our heroine began to fix her makeup, Olivia said they were amazing, and our heroine said that wasn't true at all, because the amazing one was Marzi, and she stood out because she was related to her. Olivia started sucking up to our heroine and said that it wasn't like that because she was constantly surrounded by people, and then she said that like petals in flower wine, the dew is just beautiful. But our heroine at this time looked at Olivia and thought that she had been given much less attention than she thought she would be. Du thought that Olivia must have expected more interest from the men in her as a foreign woman, especially because of the difference in culture. But since all their attention was on her and Marzi, Olivia didn't get any attention at all. After a short pause, Du asked Olivia what she was doing here, and at first Olivia started to panic a little, but gathered herself and said that after a long journey she was a little tired and wanted to rest. And Du started to smile and said that Olivia was probably tired of even talking and she shouldn't worry about it just to rest. Du noticed that Olivia had put something in her purse and wondered if she could have touched it. And then, our heroine thought that Olivia never got rid of her habits and she connected this situation with the one she had heard earlier about Charlene losing her ring. Our heroine again thought that Olivier had stolen that ring, but afterwards she thought that it could not be. But she noticed that when she entered the room it seemed to her that Olivier was hiding something, and it seems that our heroine had a plan, and she took her hairpin from her hair and put it on the locker. Du told Olivia that she was up early today too, and that's why she was a little tired. And Olivia asked our heroine if she wanted to take a nap, and our heroine said that she probably would and would rest for about 30 minutes. Olivia noticed the hairpin left by the dew and it seems that she thought to steal it and waited for the moment when our heroine falls asleep and she can easily steal that hairpin. And while waiting, she started to call the Countess, that is our heroine. And at the moment when she noticed that our heroine fell asleep, she immediately stole that hairpin and was going to leave. The moment Olivia was about to leave, she heard someone approaching that room and immediately started to panic. And one girl outside the door said it had changed since last year, and another said if it had, they wouldn't easily go into the room. Olivia panicked and started to run and leave that room, and right after she left the room, our heroine woke up. 
and it seems she wasn't even asleep, and it was just her plan to catch Olivia, and when she didn't find her hairpin, she thought it was to be expected. Immediately after that, two girls came into the room, who saw our heroine, and said that they did not find her in the garden, but it turned out she was here, and our heroine said that she was a little tired and decided to take a nap, and then asked the girls what time it is now, and one of the girls said that a little over 5 p.m., the girls said that they disturbed and woke up our heroine, but Rasa said that in no way they did not disturb her. But on the contrary, thanks to them she woke up in time, and then said that if not for these girls, she could have slept through the whole tea ceremony. One of the girls said that if she thought well, she noticed that Miss Marzi was looking for our heroine recently. And after that, our heroine said that if it was really so, then she would hurry up and go to her friend. After that, our heroine came to the table and began to say that her hairpin is lost and noticed. It girls asked her if something happened, and our heroine said that her hairpin has disappeared and she now does not know what to do. After all, this hairpin she received dear to her person. The girls told our heroine that they would help her find the hairpin and asked her what it looked like, and Rasa said that she would be very grateful and that it was a hairpin the size of a palm decorated with sapphires. And the girls said in surprise that it must be a very expensive hairpin, and they need to find it as soon as possible. The girls began to search the whole room but could not find anything, and at one point one of the girls asked that she had lost her hairpin here, and the other said that perhaps she had dropped it in the garden or in the carriage on the way here. But our heroine said that it was not so, and her hairpin was definitely here when she fell asleep. Do thought that if she pointed to Olivia as the culprit without reason, it might cast a shadow over herself, and at this time, one of the girls suggested that she should go to Duchess Sullivan about the lost article, and the other said she was sure that with the Duchess's help, her precious article would be found. Do said that it looks like she has to do it, because they tried very hard, but did not find her. And at that moment, our heroine thought that it would be much easier to involve a third party. And then she approached one of the girls, and holding her hands thanked her for trying to find her hairpin with her. This girl said she hoped very much that Dew would find her, and our heroine thought she hoped very much that these girls would be witnesses in her game, and that she would eventually catch Olivia. Talking among themselves, girls heard the sound of bells, and one girl asked others if they also heard it, and our heroine thought that this bell that rings when the royal family arrives or other distinguished guests. Dew said that it seems to be some important guest, and the other girls said that they should go there as soon as possible. And now we learn that this is a long tradition of the Kantian circle of communication, which our heroine learned about from Marzi. It turns out that when the organizer of the tea party rings the bell, all the guests should stop doing their business and gather together, which is what our heroine did. But still, she could not understand who it could be, and thought that in the list of invited guests shown to her by Mr. Langaro, there was no such person. The Duchess said that everyone seemed to be gathered, and first of all she expressed her sincere thanks to all those who had come to their little tea party, and said that this alone made her overjoyed. But she said that they had an unexpected guest today. Upon hearing of the important guest, our heroine thought it was the ruler of Kant, but the Duchess introduced the blessed and most illustrious land of Westeros, Prince Sionian Saul Meyer of the royal family of Summerhurst. Everyone began to wonder that a prince had arrived, and they welcomed Saul, saying that it was really worth living for. But our heroine was shocked and thought that he had come to see her, and she remembered the scene from the past where they spent the night together. Our heroine was confused and thought that it couldn't be, and that he must have come to see the results she'd achieved, and she also thought that their relationship was just for the sake of the deal, and she thought it was foolish to expect anything more. Dew was a little upset and thought that it would be better for her to concentrate on the test instead of thinking about unnecessary things because she didn't want to disappoint His Highness. And then she gathered herself and started talking to the other girls, saying that she didn't expect to see Saul in person either. Our heroine said that Zion appeared like the sun as beautiful and noble, and someone else said that he truly deserves to be an uninvited miracle. And Marzi was watching all this and approached our heroine asking what was happening to her. Rosa said that the soul had arrived and they were talking about him, and Marzi asked our heroine if she was not afraid that his highness was here. But our heroine began to deny it, saying that it was not so at all, and herself thought that originally she was going to make a fuss about the disappearance of her hairpin. 
Our heroine, because of the appearance of His Highness, left this idea because she thinks that it would become ambiguous. But she thought that maybe she is wrong and just looking for an excuse. And at this moment, Marzi noticed Du's hair and asked her if she did not tie her hair today and where is her hairpin. Rosa smilingly said that she had taken the hairpin off to take a nap, and when she woke up it was gone. But Marzi made a fuss about it and asked if someone had stolen the hairpin. But at her raised tone, the Count and his wife approached them and asked Marzi what had happened. Marzi said that it looks like someone took her relative's hairpin, but she couldn't understand who could have stolen it. And our heroine said that it's not so important because maybe it was just lost. But Charlie couldn't understand how it could be lost. One girl said that she heard that before the lady fell asleep, the hairpin was there and that it was definitely stolen. And our heroine said that it seemed so. However, they could not understand who had done it. And immediately all the people began to talk among themselves. And someone said that there was someone here who was so needy that he could steal the countess's jewelry. One man said that there was no way the Kantian nobility could have done such a thing and asked the others if they had any idea who could have done it. And then the others heard about it, and one girl asked if something else had happened besides the solo visit. And another said that a thing of the Countess Victoire was missing. While these girls were talking to each other, Olivia was there, and she heard all this and immediately rushed to our heroine and started to pretend that she did not know about it asking what all this could mean, but our heroine thought that now Olivia was caught. Du took Olivia's hand and asked her if she remembered the hairpin she was wearing today, and Olivia said she did, but asked if it was the green hairpin, and then said it seemed to be blue. But our heroine said it was very strange because she remembered falling asleep while they were chatting in the break room, and when she woke up, she noticed her hairpin was gone. Olivia was confused, and at that moment other people asked if it could have been Lady Olivia. So who took the hairpin? And other people asked if Edie and the foreign country could have done such a thing. But still they said that if you listen to the Countess, there was no one else who could have done it but Lady Olivia. Our heroine Du remembered that Olivia loved the color blue very much, because most of the things she lost because of her former relatives were the same color, namely aquamarine jewelry, sky blue tea party dress even shoes with silk and aquamarine inserts. Our heroine thought that she had not mentally chosen her companions for this trap. But still there was an unexpected coincidence. And then Olivia began to justify herself and said that she seemed to remember that before going to bed, the Countess had taken off her hairpin. But she said that immediately after that she had left the lounge and then the hairpin was still there. Olivia told Dew to think about it. Well, maybe someone else came in and out after her. But then the two girls who had come into the room after Olivia approached and said that when they came in, the hairpin was already gone. Because just as they came in, the Countess woke up and found it missing. The two girls asked Olivia if she really suspected it could be them. And Livia said it wasn't, and they misunderstood her. But Rasa asked Olivia if she left the room right after she fell asleep. Olivia said that of course it was, because she said that she was worried that she might wake her up and our heroine asked her what time it was, and she said that she didn't know exactly, but she suspected that it was about five o'clock, and our heroine said that she was sure, because when she fell asleep, she heard the bell ringing and it was five o'clock. One of the girls who was there at the time said that they too had heard the ringing when they were in the corridor outside the restroom, which is when they decided that they should take a 30-minute break before continuing, and our heroine confirmed that by the time Lady Sophie came in, the hairpin was gone. Du said she could guarantee it, and Olivia started playing the victim and asked Countess Victoire if she suspected Olivia was a thief, and she said she really didn't, and that Du was being very cruel to her. Charlene then asked Du if she could say something, and after getting permission, she said that Olivia was not that kind of person. Plus, she claimed that Olivia was new to Cant County, and that there might have been some mistake, and asked Du to think carefully. Our heroine looked at Charlene and asked if she had lost any valuables lately, and Charlene remembered that she had lost her ring and looked at Olivia. But Olivia started to panic, and the people around her said that first Lady Charlene's ring was missing, and then the Countess's hairpin, and it was too much of a coincidence for them. They said that judging by the time interval it all matched, but Olivia lost her temper and began to shout, saying that she really hadn't done anything wrong, and if they didn't believe her they could search her. 
But at that moment, the Duchess approached and told Du and Olivia that she had heard that there had been a theft at the beginning of the ceremony. The Duchess asked Du if she could help her, but Olivia asked the Duchess if she could be her witness, and the Duchess couldn't understand what she meant by witness. And suddenly Olivia asked the Duchess to search her so that everyone would know she hadn't stolen anything. The Duchess asked Olivier if she really wanted her to search her right now, and Olivier said she really did, since if the Duchess did it, she would believe it all at once. But the Duchess said at least they should do it inside and find out the truth sooner. Olivia yelled and said she wanted to do it right there so her conscience would be clear. And eventually the Duchess agreed and searched Olivia's bag and then said the lady's bag was empty. A little later said there was nothing between the dress and the shawl either. Olivia started smiling and asked everyone if they saw that she hadn't stolen anything. But Du asked Olivia if she could look at her. Well, Olivia asked Du if she didn't trust Duchess Sullivan, and the Duchess said it was okay and the Countess should do as she wished. Our heroine thought she'd start searching the inside of the sleeve and then the neckline, but she thought it was too deep, and if she stuck her hand in it, there'd be trouble. And Olivia then asked Du if she was sure she was innocent. Our heroine sat down and began to search Olivia under her dress and asked Olivia not to move because she wanted to prove her innocence. But Olivier began to shout at our heroine and asked her how far she was going to go because no matter how much she searched, she would not find anything. When our heroine was approaching the place where she hid the stolen goods, Olivia started yelling for our heroine to stay away and let her go. And at one point, Olivia fell to the ground and Charlene's ring fell out and she looked at Olivia very disappointed, while Olivia looked like a crazy person. Olivia was frightened and began to justify herself telling Charlene that it is not as it seems because she claims that she accidentally picked up this ring and was going to return it later. But Charlene asked Olivia for some reason did not say anything because she perfectly passed that Charlene is looking for it. Charlene said that Olivia knew that Hayden even followed the dress code for the ring and then Charlene said that she thought it was weird from the beginning because after Olivia visited the room, her ring disappeared. Olivia asked everyone to wait because she claims she can explain everything and they shouldn't jump to conclusions. But Rasa said she didn't think so because she found something else besides the thing that fell out that she has under her skirts. Rosa pulled out one makeup brush and said she found it under Olivia's skirt and the Duchess said it was on the dressing table in the break room. But Olivia ran to Rosa and yelled at her that she didn't steal it and it wasn't true she didn't take it. At this point, the Duchess said that if she says she didn't steal it, then she stole something else. But she didn't steal anything because her brother a bitch Winchester from Northland. And she doesn't see why she should steal when the family business is thriving and there's always money entering the house. At this point, Sion comes in and says that it's all a habit and that if he's not mistaken, Olivia was expelled from her home country for other habits. And it seems that Olivier started to panic but said that she wasn't expelled. Olivia says it's not true at all and her parents recommended her to travel and she took their advice. But then Longaro shows up and says it's called a confinement order. But Olivia says it's a groundless rumor because she claims she hasn't touched other people's things. Langaro said that instead of stealing, she touched another man's husband. And immediately after this statement, everyone started discussing Olivia among themselves. And someone said that they couldn't understand how she could do it with another man's husband. And then Langaro went on to say that Olivia is the second daughter of the Marquis of Northland. Lagaro says that Olivia has survived three social seasons and is still single, and her hobbies include looking at paintings and visiting the racetrack. And with that came rumors of her affair with Robin, the racetrack manager and son-in-law of Duke Charles Hirschbent. After that, Olivia left the country without setting a date for her return, and afterwards asked Livia if he was wrong about something. And then our heroine remembered those moments when she was Letitia, and one girl shared her worries with her. The girl said that she didn't trust men and that all she needed from them was decent genetics to pass on to her children. And then we learned that Robin Armand was from a foreign baronial family, but he was lucky enough to be chosen by Larissa, the only daughter of the Duke of Hirschbent. We learned that although his success is solely due to his looks, Robin, being a simpleton, has not been able to give up his habits. And then Letitia asks Larissa if she's not worried, and she says that if she's talking about rumors about Robin, she's not okay with it. Larissa says that her father is the kind of man who would do anything for her. And then we realize that according to her, 
Carl Hirschbant loved his daughter and hated his son-in-law very much because he said that it is natural for garbage to do garbage. Her father said that if he was a man, he wasn't worth dealing with. And instead of Robin, he dealt with the women who messed with his son-in-law. And those who weren't lucky enough to hear it, don't you dare touch Robin. We return again to the tea party, where our heroine thought that this is complete madness, and she could not understand why Olivia got involved with the son-in-law of Duke Hirschbent. And then Olivia got angry and asked Langaro how dare he talk like that. Langaro said that Olivier seems to have a tendency to fixate on things that belong to other people and he thinks it's really unfortunate. And then the Duchess asked Lady Olivia to treat her and apparently she's being kicked out. Dear friends on this note, we will end the story, but if you want to see the next part, then be sure to subscribe to the channel and do not forget to put a like under this video. When it gets 40.000 views or 5,000 likes, I will make the next part for you. See you soon.